Hello and welcome to Landon Live. My name is Landon Harvey, and today we have on Australia's number one comedy ventriloquist, Darren Carr. Darren, how are you doing today? Fine, thanks, Landon. How are you? Doing well. Thank you for joining us today. Pleasure. So, Darren, let's go ahead and get right into it. How did you become a ventriloquist? Um, interested in puppets and stuff when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. uh, and then sort of teen years, that got pushed aside for music, so I became a musician okay. and did did that professionally till I was 30 wow. and then uh, then took up, for some reason, midlife crisis and went, I know, I'll become a ventriloquist. So it was actually a couple of years before 30, that's when I started performing. But, yeah, I, uh, I saw a ventriloquist when I was a kid my dad was a, a musician at one of the larger clubs, nightclub here in Sydney. So he worked with, uh, you know, lots of ventral, Arthur Worsley and um, oh, wow. Ray Allen. A lot mm. of the English vent ventriloquists used to come out here to work our club circuit. So he worked with a lot of them. And he worked with a guy called Chris Kirby, who was Australian. And he was sort of the guy that I could see on TV most of the time. So that interested me when I was a kid. And, you know, I had a little Pelham puppet. The Pelham ventriloquist doll that my grandmother bought me. Mm -hmm. But as I said, when I got to 13, ah, forget that. I don't want to play with puppets. I want to be a musician. And, uh, yeah, so I did that for years. And then what happened? Mm, David Strassman turned up right. on TV here around the early 90s, I think it was. And mm -hmm. I saw him on and I went, wow, I used to do that when I was a kid. And... Um, I don't know what twigged. I was pretty sick of the music by then. I could see the music industry going downhill. Mm. And uh, I was working, you know, still working five or six nights a week, but it was just sure. I didn't think I'd want to be singing case uh, covers of, you know, of rock songs when I was 60. So I figured find something else to do. And uh, Where were you performing as a mus musician? Oh, just around pubs and clubs. And I had a, a corporate band that was, very successful and uh so yeah I, I, I made a really good living at it for years and um and then uh yeah then i saw strassman and i was still playing at the time and i was still married at the time mm -hmm. and uh i thought i'd give this a go because with the there's plenty of time off being a musician you you don't do much with your days sure and so i um, started yeah looking into ventriloquism and uh one of the other club ventriloquist there's only a couple in sydney at the time a guy mm -hmm. called barry kraus uh he gave me the um a copy of i think it was called vent events or vent the mayor messenger or something like that it was the, a, a little booklet from mayor right studios and uh it was like a leaflet they put out a few times a year and in it it mentioned the ventriloquist convention and i thought oh that'd be cool being ironic i thought that would be good to go to and right. uh, and at the same time my grandmother bequeathed me uh, some money when she sold her unit and moved in with my mum so uh so i got some money and i went i'm going to put this to good use and and go to the ventriloquist convention and so that was 93 i did that so i'd seen i think strassman had been coming out here every year for, sort of since 1990 so i'd seen him a few times and sort of had an idea of what you were supposed to be like on stage and, and whatnot and uh, went to the convention and that was it. I bought I bought a doll when I was there. I bought Paul Winchell's video and some mm -hmm. books and uh, I met Stephen Knowles and Steve-O mm -hmm. and there was another guy called Stephen Zanofsky. I don't know where he's gone to, but he was a, a kid's magician slash ventriloquist and uh, when i got back to australia he sent me a vhs tape uh three hours long and it was all all ventriloquists that he'd uh videoed mm -hmm. off hbo and whatnot of their uh -huh. clips off comic strip live and three hours so worth of ventriloquism wow three hours worth so there was clips of jay johnson um dan horn jeff dunham um, Brad Cummings. It was just three hours and all little five, ten minute bits of each of their acts. And uh, so that got me started. I went, right, this is what you're supposed to do 
and this is how you do it and say you walk off stage how you you know just things yeah. like that just seeing different yeah, characters and it was yeah and that's mm -hmm. that's all i had i was stuck in you know over here on the other side of the world and uh we didn't have all that at that stage yeah. We didn't have HBO and all that sort of stuff. So I'm, I'm pretty sure the internet was only sort of just getting into gear. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, I remember, yeah, if I had the first dealings with Selberg and, and Mayer, it was all via uh, via mail. You'd send the money through in the post and there was no email. And mm -hmm. yeah, so that, <laughs> that was interesting. It's like the Stone Age. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's, that's sort of what got me started, that 93 convention. And uh, meeting those guys and the videotape sort of set me on on course. I sort of knew what a ventriloquist had to look like and be like. And mm -hmm. and uh, so when you had started off, you had a Pelham puppet, and then when you got back into it, what was your first? Did you have a? Did you uh, switch the puppet but keep the character? Or did you just buy an entirely new puppet and say, "I'm going to start with this"? Oh or? no, that, that what was your thought? Long gone. I, I oh, don't yeah. know where that puppet went to. That yeah, it, it got thrown out in a garage sale or something. Because I was a musician, I didn't want to play with puppets. That was not right. cool. Um, so I'm, I, I seem to remember the first figure I got was uh, I got a Marianne Taylor duck at the convention. I remember that. Yes. And then when I got back, I went right. I started and I started getting. A, I bought a Maya figure, and then mm -hmm. uh, I've had pretty much everything. I think a Hearts and a Alfaro and or oh, a Rene. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I've had quite a, yeah. Wow. And, and then I landed on a, I saw Selberg's um, ad in one of the magazines, a dialogue magazine, I think it was, and I went, right, that's what I want. I want one of those and set my sights on it. And uh, lo and behold, only 12 years later, I got it. I'm joking. It's a joke. It's a joke. It's for, it was no, 14. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like, um, oh, yes. I still, still. So what? What was it like? I still what was your first, <laughs> He's up there somewhere. What was your first convention like? What was? Uh... It was mind blowing because I never hung around with ventriloquists. I'd never seen ventriloquists work much, and and uh, so I got there, and all of a sudden, there's sort of I think there must have been three, four hundred people, and uh, it was just incredible. It was. The th the th those three days that I spent there was uh, the best three days of of my sh show business life because I learned I learned so much. I remember um, uh, Ron Lucas was on the, the Saturday night show and that just blew my mind. I'd never seen or heard of him, mm -hmm. and I'd never seen or heard of anybody. And all of a sudden, at the one convention, I remember seeing it was like Brad Cummings and Dan Horn, Jeff Dunham, Ron Lucas, uh, Jay Johnson. It was just insane. It was insane. And I walked away going, right, I know what to do. And I, I watched the open mics, so I knew sure. what not to do. And <laughs> just between, between between the two of those, and uh, I sort of, yeah, I talked to people and watched all the lectures and did all that. And, uh, yeah, I think I, I went back either the next year or the year after. I can't quite remember probably would have been the year after because I, yeah, I had a son by then, so I wouldn't have gone over. But uh, yeah, it was just that, oh, I remember it. I remember it so well. It was um, meeting meeting all these people that I'd never heard of that were just insanely talented. And, uh, and Al Gettler. <laughs> well, what, I'm, I'm curious, what, where did you start uh, performing as a ventriloquist? Did you do fairs and festivals and then kind of work your way up? Or did you do no. everything when you started? Or what was your... I did a few kids' shows. I used to do a little, okay. little bit of magic. So I did mm -hmm. kids' shows, the typical, you know, birthday parties. And uh, because I was working at night with the band, um, I couldn't really just dive into jobs. So I, uh, we have a what's called a club circuit out here. And it's sort of mostly it's either uh, the clubs for veterans or their clubs connected to sporting associations. So every suburb in Sydney has three or four clubs. And sure. uh, a lot of them used to have entertainment. And so it's not like a nightclub. It's sort of based on mini casinos because there's a lot of poker machines, slot machines mm -hmm. involved. Um, and there's a restaurant and everything. But most of them used to run shows. And so I 
entered one of these talent quests that they ran on a Sunday afternoon and and got through that talent quest or won that afternoon with my five minutes of sparkling humour and a song tacked onto the end. And uh, didn't know, but if you won that week, you had to come back the next week. Hmm. And, yeah, pretty much put your crown back on the table and go, right, anyone else want to have a go? Problem was I won really? six weeks in a row. <laughs> I had to go back every week. Six with, weeks, with, wow. Well, I had to go back with like five new minutes of material every week plus a new mm. song or, you know, extra material. And I did that for six weeks and lo and behold, by the end of it, I had an act. I could do 30 minutes. And uh, every week I was trying to figure out a new way to come on stage, a way to finish the act. And, and I'd sort of learned all that from being a musician, how to, you know, work out set lists for bands, how to take it up and down. And and so I sort of knew what I was doing on stage, but the uh, the comedy thing was a whole new thing for me. And uh, so I still started doing that, and there was an agent at the last, in the grand final of the event, of the uh, the talent quest, and she said, have you got an agent? And I went, no. And she said, you have now. And uh, I was working, working within the month doing jobs, around the other clubs and by that stage I'd finished with the band and I was just playing solo at various pubs so I could take take time off when I wanted. I didn't have to work at night. I could do a ventriloquist show instead. So over the space of sort of two years I went from being full-time musician right through to being full-time ventriloquist. So you, knew, um, you were never a combination of both? You went from one directly to the uh, other? Well, there was yeah, a two-year period where I sort of started swapping there was less okay. music jobs and more ventriloquist jobs. I'd obviously take preference over the ventriloquist jobs because mm -hmm. uh, they were paying a lot more than the music jobs were. So right. I could make the same in one night doing ventriloquism as I could working a, a week uh, as a musician. So so if I take yeah I'd take the nights off and and uh, do that, and I started I was only I was only probably two years into being a ventriloquist, and I started working on cruise ships and. Uh, because we had our own sort of ships out here in Australia that did, did a run, so you could work on them, and you're not you're not really working for international audiences. You're mainly working for Australian audiences, and oh. uh, yeah, so that was good because it was the same crowd as I'd used to working for in the clubs. And, have you noticed uh, a difference in in the material that you have to build or the oh, characters yeah. that you have to use? Yeah, not not so much then, but when I moved mm. to doing. Um, Princess and Cari uh, Royal Caribbean and, and Norwegian lines, when you're working for a much more broader audience, a lot of Americans, quite a few Europeans, I really had to change the act. Is it just the terminology or is it other yeah, little, it actual Well, there's certain, certain words. Okay. Um, there's certain words that Australians would use that Americans wouldn't understand mm -hmm. and uh, things like that, you know, you know um, you know, most Australians would say, no, thank you, I'm full, I've had enough to eat, where most Americans probably wouldn't. And uh, I shouldn't talk. <laughs> Look at the size of me. I am huge. Looks like my neck's blowing a bubble. I um, I, I did have to change the, uh, the material somewhat. The main thing I had to do was slow down and really? enunciate, okay. yeah, so people could understand. Because I used to talk with a real Australian accent Mm -hmm. You know, throw another shrimp on the barbie and all that sort of stuff. And yeah. then uh, you didn't get that at all, did you? You're too young for that one. I got it. You got it? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so I used to have to slow down and I'd start rounding out my words to the point where most of the people on the ships thought I was English because I used to yeah. talk quite proper on stage and pretend to uh, enunciate all my words properly and slowly so people could understand what I was talking about. And did that so ever get annoying, or did you just no used to it? Really? Okay. No. When you get your paycheck of you know two and a half grand <laughs> at the end of the week, you, I'm happy to talk right. like an Englishman for a couple of hours a week. That's sure. not a problem at all. And <laughs> <laughs> it was, and it was, it was, it was quite bizarre. But that's hey, it was a good living, and I was at that time I was single, uh, which is really the only way you could happily work on the ships. I think is if you're single. Um, and you enjoy a drink, and at that stage, I did. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so that was that was 
sort of did the ships for about eight years. Wow. It, uh, yeah, still mixed in with a few clubs when I came back to Sydney, but uh, mm -hmm. there was times there I was away for a couple of months at a time and, you know, ended up all over the world. Someone had told me like three years previous that that's what I'd be doing. I would have laughed in their face, but it was it was well, great. And there was a lot of work around that time and, you know, sure. a, lot of the events, a lot of the events were working ships. I'm curious, did you did you find it difficult to go from cruise ships to then land? And get your name out there, or was it fairly easy? Really? Okay. No, because I'm because because I'm because uh, of where I live. Mm -hmm. I'm, for a long time, I was the only ventriloquist. Oh. Okay. And yeah, yeah. So it was um, it was something that I sort of I wouldn't say it was a business decision. I wanted to be I wanted to do comedy, but you know I could have could easily see there's too many comedians out there. So that's probably why I went to ventriloquism. Just innately thinking in a business sense, that's something no one else is doing. Sure, that makes would you be, more marketable. Yeah, and that sort of seems to have worked. So I've had, you know, I'm certainly not the only one. Um, mm -hmm. There's a few other events in Australia that are, that are successfully working, you know, but it's it's mm -hmm. still, it's probably uh, maybe 12 at the most that I know of in Australia, and that's including part-timers and, and all that. It's, right, it's not a big everyone. thing. As I said to you earlier, if we had a convention out here, we could hold it in a phone booth. It's that. It's uh, I know of three people apart from myself that do it full time. Wow! In the whole in the whole country, so that's yeah. So it's still pretty much got it wrapped up, which is good. Yeah, that is. Um, and looking at the comments here, Chance Wolf said, "Hey, Darren, good to see you, man." And then uh, Dale Brown said uh, on on your earlier story, he said, "Sorry, you had to meet Al Gettler." <laughs> <laughs> yes no it's everyone was really nice that's what hit me with the convention just you know i was a nobody i didn't know anything about the art really mm -hmm. and uh everyone was really nice to me and uh mm -hmm. so i've got i've still got friends that i met back then which is sure. which is lovely you know and uh just but everyone that i worked like Dale, seeing dale brown work and he did a um uh a lecture and it was only a few years back and so i'd been working at this for 20 years already or whatever it was and he did a lecture and i learned so much just in that lecture about writing for characters wow and uh he did a bit with his a, a jockey puppet at the end and i was like that's great that's fantastic and i learned so much in that half hour or whatever what hour lecture it was and and this was only a couple of years ago so it's it was still great. So yeah, thanks for that, Dale. That was that was one I do remember. Oh well, that's great. So 2013, Australia's Got Talent. Talk about that. How did you how did you become part of that? Were you did they find you? Did you find them? Did you want to do the show? What was your mindset going into this? I uh, I'd been contacted a few years. I think by the time I did it, it had, it had changed stations. It had gone from a different channel. Um, so it had been going a few years. Um, I know Dean Atkinson, who is, an, is the, one of the other vets in here in Australia, he'd done it uh, a couple of years previous. And I'd always said no, because my main work uh, in the last sort of 12 years, I suppose, has just been corporate work. And I didn't think it would be any help for me to do Australia's Got Talent. Sure. Um, it's not going to help in the corporate market at all. And uh, and I thought if I don't do well on it, it's probably going to hurt. Um, so I'd said no for a long time. And my reasoning for saying no was they didn't have a judge that was a comedian. All the judges were either washed up reality stars or uh, radio DJs. And uh, it really nobody with any discernible talent. And I didn't want one of those telling me that I had no talent. I thought that was a little weird. So... Uh, they rang once and said, we have Dawn French, who's a well-known comedian in England, and uh, um, we've got her as, a, as, as one of the judges. What do you say about that? And I said, well, okay, I've said no beforehand, so I'll say yes. And so I said, as long as I don't have to do the audition, I just go straight in. And, and I also made them promise that if I didn't like my spot, um, that they wouldn't show it 
<laughs> and did you have to get yeah. that? Did you have to they have them okay like sign a contract or something, or how do you? No, no, no. I just, I just, I just sat down with the producer and I said, "Look, this is the way we sit. You guys me need me more than I'd need you in Australia. It's just there's not a lot of talent compared to America. The, the population doesn't allow it. So to run a show like that, you, you, it's really hard for them to find people that are, are going to work and work well on TV." And, well, uh, even in America, you know, the whole America's Got Talent thing seems like more of a question than a title for a show, <laughs> seeing some of these acts. It's, but it's so, the same. There's a lot of professionals don't want to go on it. They think it might harm right. them. You know, there's, mm -hmm. in the end, there's only going to be one winner. And right. uh, it's, it's, it's hard work to, to, to do it and, and make sure you're going to do well on it. It's because it's not up to you. It's they right. can really make you look like an idiot. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so I just sat down with the producer. I said, "This is where I, I, you know, I stand. I'll do it, but these are my provisos, and wow. uh, and I don't do the audition. I just go straight in and do the first you know, televised sort of thing. And um, and I, uh, if I don't like it, you cut me out of the program. You know. So of course I got through. So the ego went. Oh, you're, I'm not going to cut myself out of the program, even though I didn't really like what I did. I wasn't overly happy with it." um it still worked and it got really good response and ended up with millions of views on youtube and all that sort of didn't hurt and but then the second one uh is when i got screwed is that the right terminology i don't know yeah, the, yeah, uh, that, that, yeah. I, I get that terminology yeah okay uh <laughs> i'd made two dolls to look like two of the judges mm -hmm. and so the idea was for me to bring out my main doll which is sort of a look-alike of me and then uh and he says yeah, i found a couple more dummies you can use and uh i open up the case and pull these two little ones out which was two two goldberg dolls that i'd rehashed to look mm -hmm. like two of the judges okay and had one sitting on either side of him and they were both remote controlled from inside uh inside his body i had an airplane remote control so they could both they could both move their mouths. And uh, so I did the rehearsal that afternoon. The producer's going, that's great. Well, that's hilarious. We love that. Fantastic. And then one of the judges found out before the filming the next day and said, no, he's not doing that. He's not making a, a dummy out of me sort of thing. And uh, so they rang me and said, you can't do it. Have you got anything else you can do? And this is like the day of the filming. Yeah. And uh, I knew none of my corporate material would work because it's just not, it's not suitable for family TV. Right. Not that it's rude, but it's just... And also the pacing of the comedy, too. Well, you've got two two and a half minutes. So you've, exactly. got, to, you've got to go bang and you've got to have this and you've got to have that. Right. So I'm at home thinking, well, the, the toucan worked. I can use the animatronic toucan. That'll work. And and what else? I can't just use him again, you know. They, mm -hmm. So I thought, what's well, going to be fine for family? So I had the baby sitting up there, actually, still. Up there. Yep. And uh, I thought I could get the, those two to work, but I just didn't have time to, to to write it and rehearse it like I want to. And so I watch. I can't watch it nowadays. I find it horrific. I was, you could see me floundering. I don't know what to do. But you know, but that that being said, I probably could have done better from my end. But then uh, it's all about the TV. So it's you know, sure. they were they were happy, and it went to a tiebreaker or something. Uh, me versus a guy that um he was in a wheelchair he had uh, uh a back injury but he was able to climb a rope and that was oh. his that was his talent and it was between me and him and um so he got the audience vote right even <laughs> even though we had to rehearse that for the live show Huh. We, had re we had to rehearse standing there. I had to go back in and stand there so I could be told you didn't win. And uh, So they let live... you know before they even do the live show. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Just, I think they were Man. afraid I was going to say something, but I <laughs> So, that we so did this, that. Did this guy, did he do shows or anything, like rope climbing shows? Or I don't, he was just no. Um, no, outside. No, he was in, of inspirational stuff. from what he did. You know, he was, right. you know. And uh, that's but yeah, I, I it's it's that's still one of the things Australia's got talent. Mm -hmm. Well, even even in uh, 
even in America, you know, sometimes it's more, you know, the the sad story background and then it's oh, like it's half and half or sometimes. But yeah. And I didn't have a background, you know. My, my right. dad played the piano and I've had a comfortable life. Uh, mm -hmm. you know. That was my story. So <laughs> that's your yeah. sob story, yeah. As as opposed to his his you know horrific car accident that he had and his broken back and yeah, so I, it's um I, I totally get it. It's all about the ratings and keeping people engaged in the show and all that. So. <laughs> It'd be funny to have a dummy with like a sad backstory. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think about that at the time, but they keep they ring me every year. It's now on a different channel mm -hmm. and. It's on its third channel now, and because uh, it lasts about three or four years, and then Pete, mm -hmm. the excitement peters out. In fact, Britain's Got Talent is here, and that does better ratings than Australia's Got Talent. So even Australians know we lack it. We lack talent as far as, <laughs> as, far as and, uh, enough to cover you know four or five years of a, sh a show goes. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, so it's 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 you know it's, it is what it is. There's no television for me over here now. It's just they we don't have uh, a a big um well 90 percent of the shows we see are american or english we don't we we have some australian shows but there's no live variety shows or there's there's no uh, comedy central live sort of thing anything like that there's nowhere to be you know right it's pretty much like that throughout the world i guess but it's um it's it's quite sad really but uh yeah yeah, I'm so lucky. did you I find do. did you find that being on the on the show helped you with getting gigs afterward, or was it just more of an experience type thing? Um, it was a good experience. You know, that mm. was that was not it was not bad. But uh, yeah. I I don't really know. It got me help help me get gigs because um, as I said, the corporate market was totally different. I don't expect businessmen to be sitting at home watching Australia's Got Talent. Mm -hmm. Um, so. People do mention it still, which uh, amazes me. I got an email the other day from some guy in England and uh, his kids watch me on YouTube, the YouTube clips. This is seven years ago. Wow. And they're four and three and they think I'm hilarious, which is nice. Yeah. Um, so I did a little video for them and sent it off. Mm -hmm. So to think it's still seven years later and I'm, I'm you know, entertaining people that weren't even born when it was on that's sort of nice i suppose yeah. i don't get any that's money cool. for it but hey <laughs> you know, nice to get some residuals well it's but, yeah, <laughs> it got up to like at one stage it was like 16 million views all up of you know the three or four different clips that were on which i found mm. pretty amazing and people yeah. will still mention it when they introduce me at a, a corporate function you know which is rather annoying you know that, that that that's my claim to fame. Um, I'm not tooting my own horn, but out here we have uh, what we call Mo Awards and Ace Awards, which are the club industry awards for performers. And okay. uh, I've won Performer of the Year five times in Australia. They never mention that. Right. They just mentioned Australia's, just got, mentioned talent. That Australia's got talent. But wow. I didn't. I didn't even get through to the grand final. So it's yeah. It was um. It was a little weird, but anyway, hey, it's it is what it is. Mm -hmm. I'm lucky now. I mean, I just do corporate, so I'm I'm uh, I'm comfortable, and I don't have to rely on TV or anything like that. There's a lot of guys that do, um, and since the clubs and the comedy clubs have passed away, um, they're relying on cruise ships, and now they can't even do that because they're all in dry dock or wherever. So, uh, yeah. It's a rather sad state of affairs at the moment if you're a performer. Mm -hmm. But um, Well, what was it like for you to write for corporate audiences? Because from what I've talked to other people, they say it's, it's very difficult because you have to be clean, but then you also have to, you know, be funny. Uh, and there's that fine line. Yeah. My, um, when I say corporate audiences, I mean everything from major companies doing conferences mm -hmm. right through to sports awards nights for the local um, football team or whatever, so okay. it's 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 not a, it's not the one act for the the whole group. Although they are all only just people, they're nothing special. They've just got different walks of life. 
So they all pretty much will laugh at the same thing. It's just the the variance of uh, the political correctness does waver a lot. So what I've decided to do uh, was write the one act and then just the, the level of uh, a language and the level of, uh, what, would you, what would you call it, uh, my demeanour mm-hmm. changes. So if I go into a sports awards night, so they're all sportsmen who play, you know, uh, football or whatever they're playing, cricket, golf, you know, whatever. Um, they're usually workers. They're usually blue collar, you know. And being right. Australian, they're a bit, they're a bit more, yeah, get a, you know, they're a bit more Paul Hogan, you know. How are you? And so you can give them a bit of language, but you've also got to change your demeanour. If you go in there wearing a suit and you're all done up and you're, good evening, how are you? Nice to see you. And they're all like, ah, it's not going to work. Right. So I take the tie off, you know, and and uh, and just go in and, you know, opening line is usually, yeah, 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 quiet and down, shush, quiet. You know, this might be a night out for you. This is a career for me. <laughs> so you're on the same level as them. Sure, right. They'll pay attention. They'll pay attention. Oh, but I don't do that when I walk into, you know, the Sydney Convention Centre for um, – uh, whoever quite did a Qantas function, you know, they're all, you know, all done up in their, they're dressed better than they dress when they're actually working on the planes. So they're all in formal gear and, you know, it's a big night out for them and there's 800 of them and, you know, you have to walk on stage with the demeanour of, good evening, it's lovely to be here. It's, a, you know, it's what a financial pleasure this is and and all that sort of stuff mm-hmm. with that demeanour. So you, 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 so I can do the same act. Mm-hmm. It's still, I'll still do same characters and everything. Yeah, wow. and just even change the demeanor of the doll. Mm-hmm. You know, my doll is multiple personality because uh, I have to do the same. It's uh, it just seems to work that way. I can have I've got a lot of dolls. I've got uh, I've got two shells full of Selbergs here and a, yeah. a Chance Wolf number one, and you know I've got a little Donald Trump behind my head there and. I've got everything, I'm, you know, and even the one I use mainly, he's, well, he's there, angle this, he's getting a repaint and a oh. re now, now that we're not working. Yeah. And I'm working on a couple of others at the moment. Um, but that's the one I use most of, unless I'm travelling. Um, then I have a smaller version that I'm rebuilding at the moment. Um, but that's it's still the same doll. The only way um, sure. I'll use a different doll, the Selberg, uh, all these get used, by the way. I do other other jobs. So I do I do a lot of country music. You're not stuff. a collector. <laughs> I'm not a collector. I just, yeah. Um, the, I do a lot of stuff for country music. Uh, what do you call them? Festivals. They sure, so you have characters that are appropriate for those audiences. Yeah. And the, you know, just a lot, a lot of stuff. For, you know, I might get to a. Um, I did a big. Uh, sorry, my brain's not working today. Um, what do they call them? The grey nomads, the people with the motorhomes. Mm-hmm. So they have a big convention. They end up with a thousand people with five hundred motorhomes in a in a paddock somewhere, and they put a stage up. Sure. Um, but they're all over sixty, over seventy. These people. So I take the old man and the old woman with me, and. You know, so all these get used. Um, the other main one that gets used is the Selberg. I don't know what he calls him. He used to call him Olaf, like a drunk character with a big yeah. nose. And he's great. great. Great looking character. Well, he's multiple professions. Mm-hmm. So if I go if uh, if I go to do like a plumbing convention, I'll dress him up as a plumber. Okay. You know, so I'll still do my normal act, but there'll be an extra five or six minutes. And I usually start with them. So I'll introduce him as uh, someone likes to say a few words from the from the industry. Oh, so you start something. with that custom material? I'll come out and say good evening. It's a pleasure to be here. I won't okay, say I'm well. a ventriloquist. I'll just you know, um, before we get started, I would like to just introduce one of your industry members to have a few minutes to talk with you about something exciting coming up. And uh, invariably, he'll come out half drunk and <laughs> and not know what the hell he's talking about. Um, but he'll be dressed appropriately. So he's sure. he's been everything from a jockey 
through to a, a plumber. Uh, he's got a full outfit, uh, like he's dressed like a golfer. Um, he's been a, a football referee and an insurance broker. Um, so oh, I just wow. dress, him in a di- dress him in a different outfit. Yeah. Um, and it's invariably the same act, although I f- certainly find a couple of jokes to do with that industry. Mm-hmm. And uh, But it normally works better if I just, he just mentions a couple of names or he mentions the boss. Uh, sure. And when I have that done in the first five or six minutes, mm-hmm. then I'm free to do the, my act. Sure. And I'm, I'm sure it also kind of breaks the ice between you and the audience. Oh, for sure. The, so you know, much. They can relate to, and then they're, then they're okay with the fact that you're a ventriloquist, and then you can go into your other material. Yeah, yeah. You know. Well, it's just something I just learned a long time ago, and I, was, I think it was when I started to work the ships, that not all audiences are the same. You've got to really alter your act slightly towards the audience. Don't expect them just to love you because they might not like what you are. Mm-hmm. So I, I try and make it um, just the way I dress, the way I talk. Uh, the material, um, as far as the mainly the level of the language. Here in Australia, you can still swear, at, 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 especially at sporting functions and things like that. It's still totally acceptable. Um, you don't. You still got to be politically correct. Don't get me wrong, but you, you still use language. And so, I just add language to the act. And he'll sort of say the same jokes, the same punchlines, but they'll just be. Yeah, the, the few the few extra words just help it push it in that direction of the style of audience that you've got in front of you. So sure. that's the way I work anyway. Wow. Well, we have uh, Sherry uh, Sherry Brown Rosner said, "What a great entry!" And uh, I, th- I think so too. That's that's really neat. I like how you how you open with that. That's that's truly great. Can you talk a little bit about your process for writing for characters? Um. I don't really have a process. As I said, I've got the set act that I use most of the time. It's been the same, well, the same basic act for a lot of years. It, it keeps changing, but I don't sit down and actually do that. There might be another line or an ad lib that happens and that will stay in the act and another line just disappears because it's because it, the ad lib that I used worked better than the line. Or right. So I'd actually sit down and write. Um, when I have the multiple character doll, yeah, I'll just get on the internet and go type in plumbing or painters or, you know, builders or whatever, I'm, whoever I'm working for, and just mm-hmm. find find three or four jokes that pertain to that particular. I've got quite a catalogue now. I can look up in my in my computer builders and there's, you know, there's a few lines there or even got funeral directors. So, wow. yeah, 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 I've done, done a few jobs for them. And it's... Uh, so it's, I'm pretty much covered now, so I don't write a lot nowadays. I still, um, I'll still buy every joke book that comes out. You know, I still I try to watch a lot of comedy. As far as I like watch a lot of sitcoms, because mm-hmm. sitcoms are more dialogue based. So it's sure. you know I don't watch a lot of stand up because it's they're all joke based or it's it's it doesn't really work well in a a situation with with two people talking so yeah a lot of a lot of our sitcom frazier and stuff like that were brilliantly written yeah. and written for two people to be talking and mm-hmm. so the jokes are set up perfectly for two people yeah and, i, I uh, love frazier yeah it's, frazier, it's really interesting yeah. how it's how these sitcoms are character driven and then when they do have the the jokes that just adds on and layers the character oh yeah mm-hmm. well frazier was always coming in contact with different people you know, any sitcom is. Every, everyone loves Raymond. It's always something different. It's it's it's, and they're just lines. They're just lines, but it's the way they're constructed and written, and and uh, they're perfect for ventriloquist routines. And uh, I just don't feel that yeah. Jeff Jeff Dunham does it really well. He's just a master of of being able to write something that he doesn't really have to interact with the doll all that much. Mm-hmm. It's just he's just doing a setup, and then the Walter or whoever does the, right. does the brunt of the joke. It's interesting it's not... that you say that because it's you, you see a lot of, especially with the professionals and the that are working ventriloquists today. You see different, just like you see comedians, you see different styles of ventriloquists. Mm. 
So well, you have Jeff joke. Donimus, which is like a stand-up. Joke, 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 joke. Exactly. He's like a stand-up uh, yeah. punch, and with a he's like a stand-up comedian with a puppet. And then you have, uh, you know, Dan Horn, which is uh, he's got jokes, but he's it's more situational comedy yeah, and yeah, physical yeah. comedy. What would you define your style? Um, I don't know. It's it, it's probably more it's more joke driven than anything. Okay. Um, a lot of. A, a lot of my work too is also MC work and stuff like compare work for conferences and stuff like that. And I do a lot of one-liner jokes. Um, and so I, I think one-liners a lot of the time. Mm-hmm. So if I come up with a joke for the dolls, I usually have to embellish it to make it more interesting as a joke for me and a puppet. Cause all I'm thinking oh, so is you, one-liner. Are you saying, oh, you think of it as a one-liner and then you have to rewrite it. To I have it. to. Yeah. Yeah. So look, I enjoy one-liners more than anything. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's why I enjoy Jeff's work because it's very one-liner based. It's yeah. set up and punch, set up and punch. Um, someone like Jay Johnson works more of a, a continual conversation. There's very little set up, punch, set up, punch. And he kind um, of embellishes on the backstory of the character. If he yeah, brings out a yeah. monkey or whatever. He, uh, yeah, well, I just find the corporate audiences don't, don't, they don't like that for mm-hmm. some reason out here. You've got to be bang, 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 bang. You've got to be in their face. And uh, so that's why I tend to work like that. I tend to, and I have so many one-liners and stuff written down and in my head now that it's, that's, I'm set in that way. And uh, just, just before the lockdown, I did a job and the, the old story where I went to Melbourne and the, the doll went to Adelaide. And so I'm stuck at a job, no puppet. It's not going to make the job. And so they said, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? And I was like, I'm fine. I'll just do stand-up. And they were like, what? I said, yeah, I just, you know. So I just went on and did 40 minutes of stand-up. And uh, and they just got a guy up at the end and squeezed the back of his neck and said, that's what I normally do. And so not only did they really like it, Mm -hmm. um, but they booked me back the following year. They've already booked me in for next <laughs> year long, yeah. to do my actual act. So, yeah, that's that's a, it's a plus having that. So, so I'm I'm curious. Did you just take the puppet material and convert it back to one liners, or did you have your own forty five minutes of of stand up that you could just pull from? No, it's got my own forty five minutes of stand up, okay. and I don't. It's not set and written. I just have little blocks. So it'll be jokes about being fat, or my, the fact that I'm not married anymore. Just just that. It's mm-hmm. just stuff I've collected over the years from from books and stuff just old one-liners and i'm not I'm not ashamed to use old jokes because they're only old if you haven't heard them before uh, no that's not right they're only old if you've heard you've you you're they're yeah anyway um <laughs> sorry <I> just, <laughs> it, 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 it i don't know why I remember these jokes i just do they go mm-hmm. in there for some reason they just stay there and when they need to come out, they can. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was another job not too long ago and I got there and they booked another act and the other act didn't turn up. So they're like, oh, what are we going to do? You know, we, you know, they booked another comedian. He didn't show. And I just said, well, I can do more if you want. I've already done 45. But, mm-hmm. you know, I just said, look, you know, if, if you really need more entertainment for the night, and I just got up on stage and did 45 minutes of stand-up. And it, for some reason, I found it easy. I don't know why. There must be a lot of stuff up there. But, um, mm-hmm. but it doesn't get used a lot. It just stays in there. You know, don't ever ask me to, you know, to go on stage. And then I'll say, you know, how long do you want me to do? And they go, oh, as much as you want. Don't ever say that to me because there's a good chance I'll be there three hours later. It's just Put you on a time limit. <laughs> Verbal diarrhea that just keeps coming out. It's like, blah. Excuse that, please. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, no, I, look, I, I had seen a video of of that you were that you had done a corporate audience, and you were so you would open with about fifteen minutes or so of stand up, and then you brought out the puppet, and it was so it was the same level, but it was interesting to see your style as a stand up comedian, and then how it transferred to a ventriloquist. Yeah, I've got to I've got to work on that. I think there's 
Um, it's just because I'm so comfortable doing it now that I don't really think too much about it. Sure. And uh, I've got to really try and get more of a personality for the doll, I think. It's not, there doesn't seem to be too much of a gap between me and him. No, but what then I was again, saying is it doesn't seem hacky. You know, I mean, it doesn't seem like I've done my stand up. Now let me get, you know, little Bobby or whatever and pull, oh, you know. Right. Yeah, it's very natural yeah, yeah, and yeah. very, you know. Look, it's, I, I lost the uh, the will about 10 years ago to try and, um, what would be the word, not entertain, but try and make the audience love me. You know, sure. it's, I, I'm a performer. You must love me. It's like, no, they're, they're here, and I'm the last thing on their on their mind. They're, if it's a corporate audience, they've come to, to uh, drink, on the boss's dime they've come to eat on the boss's dime they they want to network they want to try and you know connect up with that girl they can't talk to at the office because you're not allowed to do that anymore and it's all there's thousand other reasons if it's an awards night they're there to you know strut their stuff because they won this award and you know this i am the last reason that they would be sitting there so when they you know everyone's had a lot of alcohol and they've had a feed and they've been sitting there three hours and then suddenly the guy goes, all right, before we uh, bring the band on, uh, we've got a ventriloquist. You can see people's eyes roll in the back of their head. Like, what? Why? Why? Didn't we do well this year? Why are they doing this to us? <laughs> and, do you have uh, him ever introduce you as a comedian? Or do you like the fact that you get that response and then you're able to, like, flip, no, flip their expectations? No. Just, I just, just tell, I just tell them, just, just say we've gotten some entertainment for you. Mm -hmm. Please welcome, you know, Darren Carr. That's it. They can't mess it up. They do, they do still, but <laughs> don't say you're a comedian. Then the expectation is there for you to be funny. Right. Don't ever say ventriloquist because they're going to hate you from the word go. Generally, um, not hate you, but just not be into it. You know, mm -hmm. and. Uh, so I don't do I don't do any of that. Just introduce me as an entertainment. I walk out and immediately do the self-deprecating humor. You know, immediately start off with, um, you know, uh, what a pleasure it is. Financial pleasure is to be here. Uh, I know what the ladies are thinking. Oh, finally something to look at. You know, I'm sorry, girls, but I'm married. You know, and uh, it'll have to be your place. Just stuff <laughs> like that. Just just stuff that's stupid. Mm -hmm. And I'm not having a go at them. I'm having a go at me. Right. So that stops them from having a go at me because I'm already <laughs> doing it to myself. And, exactly. uh, yeah, I'll do all the fat jokes, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then I'll just gradually just lean in and, you know, I'm, and mention the fact that I'm single, you know, um, and do jokes about that. It's just, it's just a couple of jokes. And then I just end up finish up by saying, "Well, the reason I'm single is probably because I'm a ventriloquist." And by that time, they're used to me. So sure. me saying I'm a ventriloquist is just nothing. It's like, well, right. this couldn't get any worse. <laughs> you know, we've already got this. <laughs> we've already got this fat middle-aged guy spruiking about how he's single. What what could be worse? And uh, <laughs> so when you pull the doll out, it's actually oh something different for them. You know, sure. And then he starts having a go at me and having a go at the audience and doing the old shtick, mm -hmm. and uh, and he ends up. I get so annoyed with him, I put him away. And then, you know, I'm sure we can f do better. What else are we going to do? And you know, we have to try something different. And then I get the uh, I've got this really new idea. I might share it with you, right? I get a person on stage, mm -hmm. and I put a mask on them. Oh. Yeah, I know. Don't tell anyone. It's hilarious. It's You've great. got to see it. I'm sure no one else is doing it. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I, I remember seeing Ron Lucas. Not, do that not anymore. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, I remember seeing that in 93. I think Luke, Ron Lucas did it then. And yeah. uh, I was like, wow, that's a great idea. That's, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that, at the time, no one else was doing it. It was just Ron, you know. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and then yeah, Bill Bowley was selling the mask with the pull string under under the table. <laughs> and uh, so I got got one of them. And that's, yeah, that was, I don't know. So that would have been 95 or something like that. So was that 25 years ago? Wow. So it's, yeah, it's it's been a bit of a, a bit of a thing. I don't know if this is true or not. I don't, but anyway, uh, 
I did the mask routine at a Vegas convention. Uh, when was that? Was it the early, early two thousand in Vegas? Yeah. Yeah, the yeah, one by couple, Valentine Vox. Yeah, there was a couple of years there where where they they didn't run the convention in um, in Kentucky, so Valentine. Yeah, I think that was and, a separate convention. It was a separate convention, yeah. Mm. But um, for some reason, I don't know. Uh, I don't know why they didn't run the convention in Kentucky, but they just didn't. It was one or, one or two years, and Valentine picked up the mantle and and decided to do one, and then he ran. I think he ran five years, maybe. Um, yeah, but I remember going to the Vegas one, and uh, I did the mask routine there, and it just so happened there was a young lady in the audience who um, was just starting. She was there with her dad, Tom Conti, the actor. And uh, yeah, um, <laughs> so I don't wow. know if there's any connection to that, but <laughs> I could be wrong. I could be very wrong, but that's that's my recognition. I do remember meeting Nina at there. She'd never been to one before, and it was all new to her. And her dad was with her, and yeah. Look, I probably wasn't the only one doing the, the mask there, but that was that's my recollection. And it's a great story when people go, I've seen that girl on the TV do the mask thing before. And they go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah now she, she pulls out this giant rack of masks with like made by oh, every yeah. possible maker. <laughs> yeah. I, I went to see her in Melbourne oh, at a comedy festival a few years back and I got there late just as the show was starting and the guy at the front door said, are you by yourself, sir? And I went, look at me. Of course I am. And uh, he said, we've got one seat left. And, of course, it was down the middle in the front row, right oh. on the aisle. Yeah. Yeah. So when it came time for the, uh, I, you know, I need someone to help me. <laughs> what about you? And I was like, oh, you really don't want to get me up. And <laughs> she went, oh, come on, come on. And people started going, come on. And so I got up and I went, just play it straight, Darren. Just don't say anything. She said, what do you do for a living? And uh, I can't remember what I said, plumber or something like that. Just you know, mm -hmm. right. and then and I did did the whole thing and did the dance and you know, mm -hmm. and uh, I talked to her later and she <laughs> said, "I'm actually a ventriloquist." She went, oh. <laughs> "Did she recognize you from the Vegas convention?" Uh, I mentioned it, but she didn't. But that's, that's hardly surprising. Look what she looks like. Look what I look like. Yeah. She's not going to remember me. No, no. Um, but that was, yeah, so that was 2000, maybe 2002? I don't know. I can't remember. I'm very bad on dates. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Uh, we have yeah. a comment from Damien James. He's asking, what do you think will be the new mask now that we can't do it anymore? Well, well, Damien, who makes fantastic masks, I have one of his massive his yeah, stuff yeah, is yeah. so cool how when you oh, have the man, lips this close is, and they all that the movements this, are insane. This thing is I'm trying to find out where it is. It's up in a case somewhere up here. Yeah, I, I packed everything some away. Killer, killer work. Yeah, once I stopped working and I knew we weren't gonna work for a few months, I put everything away because I figured mm -hmm. it's just gonna get dusty otherwise. Um yeah. yeah, so what I'm doing is I've got Damien's mask and I'm changing the remote control to foot operated. Hmm. Yeah, so he's got a little trigger hand thing uh, that works because remote mm -hmm. control mask. Right. And so I'm making it foot operated so I can play the guitar and they can sing while I play the guitar. Oh, that's great. So that's, that's my... Uh, if we go back to working and people aren't running and screaming when I try to put a mask on them. Mm -hmm. That's that's what I want to aim at. That'll be my little mask routine. I don't know if anyone else is doing that, but I haven't seen it. I haven't, I haven't seen it done. Um, I've seen almost and, everything out there. <laughs> yeah, so there's yeah. that. Um, but that's the problem. You come up with an audience participation routine without a mask. Is a, that's a... That's a difficult, difficult uh, thing to come up with, I think. Um, yeah. Without delving into the the other the other stuff, 
like Taylor Mason sumo is just genius. Yeah. When he gets great. the big sumo wrestler, that's mm -hmm. wow. That's that's really the only way you could could. Uh, could and uh, even he's, I think he's retired that too a while back. Well, yeah, I, I I don't know. I don't sort of. Yeah, I don't watch much, but I remember that that being on that initial video tape years ago, and mm -hmm. uh, that was amazing. That was a great yeah. great bit. Um, but yeah, try and come up with something like that is really hard. I did have an idea a while back of putting a like a remote system in my in my puppet in my main Daryl doll, and that way I could say uh, he could say like I'm you know the Strassman sort of thing. I'm sick of you, but I wouldn't leave. I just go look. You think you you know you think anyone can do this and get someone up on stage and they put their hand inside him. Yet I've still got control of the mouth from yeah. a remote, so they could move his head and his all that around his eyes. They could even move the mouth thing, but it wouldn't activate. I'd have control of the mouth. That's a so different I'd way to play it. I like that. Yeah, I, I don't know yeah. if anyone's done that, um, but that's yeah. I was just trying to think about that'd be hilarious because the person has no idea what they're doing and they're oh no, and they're, they're, but they're getting the beautiful thing is they're the getting all the laughs. Mm -hmm. it, to the audience, yeah. it looks as though they're doing it. They're getting all the laughs. You know, and suddenly they're controlling your figure, and and uh, but he's still saying you know whatever he wants to you and to them, and yeah. But I know his. Uh, I know Terry Fader in Vegas. He has he has his Elvis impersonator uh, character <laughs> call out someone. There's this whole bit on how his Elvis impersonator now knows how to do ventriloquism because he's been in Terry's show forever and watched him do it. So he calls up this this uh, person from the audience and they put a mask on him and then the puppet does the mask bit. And then, and then I think Terry leaves the stage and the guy's still on the stage and they do that whole Strassman bit, but the whole, the whole switch on it is that he doesn't come to life and he's just there. Yep. And Terry comes back on and he goes, well, are we expecting to actually come to life? <laughs> like, great. I, I love that. Cause you've seen like all these ventriloquists do it where they, they, uh, you know, have their remote control dummy and yeah. Man. Just, I was yeah. trying to come up with something different that's, you know, the mask is going to be the hard thing. Will people want to put a mask on? Mm -hmm. And it's just like, uh, I, don't, I, I don't know. It's too hard to say. You know, we're pretty easy going out here in Australia. I don't think I'm going to have a problem. You know, I'll, I'll do a joke about it. I might even put a surgical mask on before I put their mask on them. Sure. You know, just to, uh, some way of doing it. To, mm -hmm. to, but I, I don't think they'll, they'll gel. I don't really think they'll, they'll worry about it. But we'll wait and see. Wait yeah. and see. The, the, was the other? Um, I was thinking of something else. So it's gone now. That's all right. It's just old age. Can you talk a little bit about? Because uh, I believe, who was it? Was it? Uh, oh, it was Dale Brown that had commented earlier about Convention 2018 and how you were the only person he's ever seen. Um, he, he said Darren is the only person I know who purchased a puppet in the dealer's room and then used it in his act a day later. That, 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 and killed with it. What a creative pro. Can you talk about the story leading up to that? Well, I was, I, I was traveling around the States. I didn't want to just go to the States and then go home. I was going, I think I went to Magic Live as well, the magician convention, a couple of weeks later in, in Vegas. So I didn't want to carry a puppet around everywhere with me. And uh, so I knew I'd want to buy a puppet because that's what you do when you go to the convention. You never have enough puppets. And uh, I've got pretty much all the same characters in Mary Ann Taylor versions. Oh, really? So if, yeah. So if I have to travel and I'm traveling to a festival and I have to take like five or six characters with me because I'm doing three days, mm -hmm. I'll pack the Mary Ann Taylors because that okay. way I can put them all in one case. It's lightweight. I can throw it in the plane. I don't have to carry heads and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, so I've got the same characters in Mary Ann Taylor puppets. Um, yeah, I think you're the first person I've talked to that does that where they've got soft puppet backups well it's just there's been too many times where I've, the dolls have gone missing on the plane or um and it's not so much i can do anything about that but they just they, they cost money and they're expensive and to travel with these you've got to have proper cases mm -hmm. and i've got a garage full of trunks and everything and uh it's just too hard too hard yeah. you know so well, the nice thing about the soft puppets yeah is that and and i i actually I actually build soft puppets as well. Is that they've since their foam bodies are, I think Marion's are bleach bottles. You can you can come pack them up pretty, you know, oh, yeah. you can set them side by side in a duffel, and then no, I've got, I've got, over that or whatever. So it, I've got a large, 
a large suitcase and I can fit five in to mm. that. So it's, yeah. um, and if you're traveling, you know, you're only allowed two pieces of baggage and all that sort of stuff. So that's one. There's like a weight requirement. Yeah. yeah. So it's just a lot easier for me. And a lot of the time I'll have to double up and I'll be flying here and flying in out of there and then having to go there. And so I can have the dolls just sitting in the cars. I don't have to redress them. I don't have to do anything. It's all just set, sure. you know. So that's, so I, when I got there, I thought I'll buy a, I'll, I'll see what's in the dealer's room. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, Selberg wasn't there, so that saved me a lot of money to begin with. And but I think I've pretty much got every one of his anyway. Um, yeah. and I don't think Chance was there either. Chance had been there the previous year, but he wasn't there this year. And uh, yeah, yeah and I was sort of looking at the Marianne Taylor, and she had a great one, and it was sort of like the, the Olaf character from Selberg, had the big nose, and he had these little wires with blowflies. Mm -hmm. On it. So it looked like he was covered in blowflies, and I went, "Oh, that's yeah. that's perfect for Australia." You know, mm -hmm. I can use use him big time, and um, oh, belly too, and everything. Yeah. Look, I just knew I was gonna I was gonna find some puppet, and if not, just borrow a puppet. I sure. already put in my I already knew in my brain what I wanted to do. I checked with a few people and realized that no one had ever put the mask on the puppet, mm -hmm. so I figured that was going to be my ending. So I knew it would be better to have a soft puppet to do that. It would have been easier. To, to put sure. it on a soft puppet than a hard too, puppet. Probably helps more. Yeah. Yeah. And I also knew that the, the, on, the, on the show was Phil Hughes and Keith uh, Hadrill or Hadrill. And uh, so I knew they'd both be doing pretty much all vent stuff. And um, I thought, well, it's not going to hurt if I do a little bit of stand up at the beginning and then sort of do half and half, do half stand up, half vent. You know, so I knew I didn't need to do part of my act or anything, and I knew I'd have time to write it when I got there and rehearse it and and all that. So, I, yeah, I bought the puppet on the first day, and uh, and then Shane West lent me his mask, and uh, yeah, it was I borrowed. I think I borrowed his suitcase as well. Wow. Yeah, it was. I'd, I'd done the shows before at the convention, so I knew it wasn't. Um, there was no pressure. Sure. As long as you were, as long as you were funny and entertaining, mm -hmm. you you didn't have to do your act. This is the way I thought about it. Mind you, the look on Mark Wade's face was a little different when he found out that I hadn't packed my <laughs> act. But uh, <laughs> I thought he was a little worried. But he said afterwards it was great. So you know. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I just sort of knew I'd, I'd have it covered anyway. And I knew I had the stand up was great at the beginning. I knew that all that was stuff was solid. I've been using that for years. So it's just a matter of bringing the doll out, having him say a few funny things, and then putting the mask on him and that not working out. And I knew that would be f funny enough to be entertaining for, you know, vents and non vents. But I also knew that for the vents, it'd be the in joke to put the mask on the doll. Right. I thought that'd be sort of cute so i asked a few people and i went well i've never seen it done so so i knew i was safe with that but yeah it was, it was a bit of a stupid thing to do not turn up with a doll to a ventriloquist convention but you know i came home Thanks for waiting for it. and it's it's neat it's a neat uh it's a neat thing that you you uh arrive with nothing and create and you kill i mean it was it was great um it was, it was nice but there it's always nice audience there it's just they want they want they want you to kill. That's the great thing. It's not like a corporate audience where they're going, come on, come on, fat boy, entertain us. How good are you, you know? This if this is they're there going, come on, yeah, yeah. And they'll, you know, they'll clap and cheer for you if they like you, which is great, you know. So it's yeah, it's very memorable doing stuff like this, you know. Do you have a favorite character with you that you could show us? Um, well, as I said, the uh this one's being re. Let me take this out of the socket. Can I do this without turning the phone off? Ah, I'll just carry the whole tripod, maybe. Oops, that's all gone. All right, so uh, here we go. So this is my Selberg wall, the wall that Tim built. Um, there's every conceivable Selberg, and most of them have had something done to them. Okay. So uh, that was a boy. That was his, I don't know what he calls Sammy, I think he calls it. Oh. So uh, I changed that to a girl. That was not too hard to do. I built those. Um, have had and a good experience with those in the past. 
Nah, and, nah, um, Samantha. Yeah. So that's that's my country singer because I do a lot of uh, country stuff. Okay. So that's got the, the boots and everything. So that's that's Crystal Chandeliers, and uh, and that was the tel- that was a Tim Selberg nerd. Oh. Uh, yeah, and I reshaped the nose. I don't know if you can see that. I reshaped the nose on that. Yes. Uh, turned you into an old lady. Um, yeah, so I sort of I, I, I tinker with them all. Um, he's had a bit of a facelift and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, there's Trump. I don't know if I want to use him or not. Um, what else? We'll go down down here further. Sorry, I'm not really good with the the camera. Oh, just take that out of there. And underneath here, there's a whole heap. There's the Chance Wolf one, and there's oh, yeah, it's quite a few others under there. I don't know if you can see them. I can't see the. Yeah, we can the see screen. them. Um, there's an old insul that I picked up recently out here that I'm going to do up. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is the main Daryl. This is the one I I made him about. 20 years ago um thanks to uh, joel leader actually i saw mm-hmm. joel leader work and he had the dummy that looked like him mm-hmm. and he also was at that convention he did a talk on um making a, a doll and and whatnot and uh so I, I bought his books and came home and made it myself wow because um yeah, he'd already quoted me like five grand or something to make one, and I think Tim Tim Selberg was ten grand to make one. So I thought, so what did you build own. him out of? Is it wood or is it a composite? Or I did a clay sculpture, and then uh, yeah, did the casting and everything. So it's, it's still all set up here to do. That's all amazing. That. That's super neat. Well, it was mother of invention, unfortunately, because uh, you know it was either that or spend the money, which I didn't have, and I didn't know if that character would work or not. I'm curious, you know. do you find it do you find it easier to perform with something that you've built, or is it just as much it doesn't bother me. You it's know. just the same for you? Okay. Some of the some of the Selbergs I've altered the controls on the head stick. Mm-hmm. So I'll just yeah, I'll 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 put a uh like if the eyebrows are on the on the forefinger, I'll move them around to the other side of the head post. Mm-hmm. Just I just drill it and put another tube on and yeah. Yeah, it's it's it can be pretty messy, but uh, look the old the old man. No, this is an interesting thing too about you know taking a, a stock character and customizing it to make it your own your own thing in your show. Sorry, that's a bad camera work. Here we go. So here, mm-hmm. let's find here. So that's the Selberg head stick. Yeah. So what I did. Was I moved the upper lip, so it's right next to the the um, the mouth control. Huh. Okay. So I can I can open the. Uh, it used to be right around here on the other side. Can you see that? There we go. Uh, yeah, yeah. Now we can see it. Yeah. So I moved it all the way around, so it's right next to the mouth control. So you can. Um, open the top lip and the and the mouth at the same time with one finger oh that's neat because i yeah you couldn't do it before you'd have to use two fingers which means you couldn't raise his eyebrows or anything. you had you know just right now you can get a lot like more that. movements yeah yeah my, my my thumb just controls his mouth whether it be the bottom lip or the top lip and i can do both or I can do either wow. so i just like tinkering with stuff like that which is sure. which is fun and uh, I'm just building a I'm building a travel Daryl at the moment, so that's the cast. I did a uh, wow, just a, just a smaller version of me that um, just to make travelling easier. If I pack sure. it into a the problem with the the wolf figure, which is I I use quite a lot of the time, mm-hmm. is that it just won't pack up um, small enough to fit in an overhead bag for oh. the flight. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I'm trying to make a smaller one. That way, the head will actually go inside the body. Take oh, the head out okay. of the, and the head will go inside the body, and then that will fit into an overhead bag. So that way, when I travel, because uh, I travel at least once a week, I'll be on a flight somewhere. 
mm-hmm. and um, I don't have to worry about the doll going somewhere where I'm not going, and I don't have to worry about it getting damaged. Yeah. Um, yeah. It'll just fit in the little overhead container. So, you know what's interesting yeah. is I had seen a a mashup of a an Alfaro figure with a Marion Taylor body, and that oh yeah. The idea of that always intrigued me because it seems like, you know, that would be easy if you're, you know, traveling or whatever, or even just building a soft body out of foam that you can easily compact and then you have the head and you can even use the body as padding, you know? Oh, yeah. Well, that's, that's, yeah. Well, I've got, uh, I've got this one, which is the, the original Selberg that I bought. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've done the same to him. I shortened the head stick and carved a bit out of the body. So his head does fit into his body now. So I can take it out, take the head out, put it inside the mould of the body, and mm. uh, he, he just fits into that little overhead bag. And uh, that's why I sort of thought, when I get some time, I'm going to make a smaller version of me to it'll fit into a, into a bag. And lo and behold, I've now got some time. Well, it's, it's, it's super neat to see your workshop and what you're working on. Chance Wolf just commented, damn, Darren, you build better than all of us. No, 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 I don't. Up close, they're not real clear. <laughs> they're not. They're not great quality up close. That's for sure. But they work for me, and mm. uh, and I, you know, I learned from looking at everybody else's stuff. You know, the first thing I did when I got a Selberg was open up the back of the head and go, "How's he doing that?" And you know, how can I change this around so it suits me better? And and uh, and all that. So everything I've sort of done has just been out of necessity because it's just it's too hard to send stuff back to the states. It cost me a couple of hundred dollars and and takes time and then um so it's just easier for me just to try it here and mm-hmm. and so i've yeah i've been pretty lucky that i can do it um sherry but it's brown not, rosner it's not something i want to do for me. well sherry sherry brown rosner uh asked why did you make the stick shorter just so it fit in the case okay. that's all so i've got uh i don't know how to flip this around so I can doesn't matter. You might be able to tap the screen and hit hit maybe a reverse camera if there's on if it's on it. No, nah, it's not doing anything. Then again, my phone hardly works these days because my fingers are usually covered in super glue. <laughs> and so, so it doesn't the touch doesn't work. So I have this little I get bag. That. Yeah, I've got a four hundred degree oh, hot glue gun that I'm always working with. So Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I cut down this music stand mm-hmm. and uh and made a top with this little flange on it, so that oh. fits in the that fits in the overhead case. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't have to worry about that. Or there's quite a few times I found the flange with the that fits a microphone stand. So I made a little piece of wood, and it's got the little flange on the bottom, so I can just grab a microphone stand anywhere I go. Oh, that's great. Use that. um, but the other thing too is a lot of function places don't have a microphone stand anymore, so. I'm used now to doing my act just holding the microphone, um, which is annoying. But yeah. that to be said, um, what was I doing? Oh, yeah, him. So I can take his head out of the body. And grab his body, fold it up into the case like that Mm -hmm. and then his head fits neatly inside his body wow that's great and it's yeah you just add yeah wow that you don't even need any it like pads it by itself that's that's no it's it's, it's, there's padding in there the the the, uh the top also you know pads it and i cut a little bit out of the base of his behind Mm -hmm. actually it's not it's not even this body actually I've swapped bodies on him. Sorry. The the one still in the case, the actual yeah, body I use. But it sits right in there. So the whole thing will go into – where is it? There we go. It goes into the uh, the overhead bag with a little stand and, unfortunately, mother of invention and this wow. necessity. You know, I just uh, – That's great. So a lot of the time now if I'm doing a, doing a sportsman's lunch or something in Melbourne – Mm-hmm. I'll put my suit on at home and I'll pack up my little bag and drive straight to the airport, stay in my suit all day and just pull him out and do my 30 minutes and fly home again. 
You know, it's it's. When do you decide that you're going to build a character for your show versus having one built or buying? Well, buying I, I don't like I don't like building. Okay. So yeah, yeah. Actually, even this bench that's here wasn't here a few weeks ago. It was like <laughs> it was like, what do I need to do? And I know I, I need to I need to paint a few right. dolls and get them fixed. I need to fix a nose on one. I've got to fix a hand on another. Um, and I knew I wanted to build the little Daryl, the travel size one. Mm-hmm. So I thought, okay, first off, build another bench, make myself some room. Um, yeah, because I've only got a small workbench here. So it's there's not a lot of workspace. Right. Um, so, yeah, it was like put another bench up. So I don't build. I don't, you know, this is, this is purely thanks to COVID-19. This is uh, this is this is the way it's attacked me. Is that okay? I need to get all these bits, bits and pieces done. Let's do it now. Make sure. a mess over the next month. Um, get everything. And I'm not good at it. I'm not. You know, it was nice a chance to say that. But look, that's there's one casting, and there's another one because the other one didn't work. And there's these ones up here because none of them worked. You know. So it's just, right. yeah, I finally found one casting that came out all right. Mm-hmm. And so that's the one I'm working on at the moment. Uh, did the mouth last night. Oh, wow. Yeah, but it looks great, but they're just rubber. They're one of those little rubber hand toys that you can buy, the mouth. Oh, really? I'll just, yeah, just cut, out the t- cut out the teeth and the tongue of mm-hmm. those and then uh, realised that the pivot point, wasn't far back enough in the head so the mouth wouldn't go down th- at the right angle so hence the bits out the back and the extra oh, bit of brass wow. just to change the pivot point so it'll sit properly in the head sure so just little things like that and then mm-hmm. i've got two nice eyeballs here from tech optics one is absolutely beautiful and the other one is covered in super glue <sighs> Because I'm not very good at doing this. So I have to, uh, yeah, chance if you know how to get dried uh, super glue off an acrylic eyeball from Tech Optics, that'd be a big help because I, I don't want to attack it with anything that's going to melt the eyeball. But uh, it's all just, yeah, pure, what would you call it? Trial. Innov- trial innovation. And error. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Trial and error. Yeah. Sure. But I enjoy well, doing it. But I build one, and then I'm like, no. So it, <laughs> it, it took me, <laughs> it took me a while. That was the original. There's the original. Uh, I'll get them away from the sun. I tried to do a living mouth version of me, and oh, Austin, yeah. was, Austin was helping me out, but I just couldn't get the leather to to work as well as I'd want it to. Mm-hmm. And and he looks a bit creepy too. So. <laughs> Since then, I've done a different sculpt, and uh, so I'll make. But I'll turn him into another character. I'll whack a beard on him and and yeah. put him in some hippie clothes or something. I don't know. He'll he'll mm-hmm. get used some way or another. That's but that's yeah. That's so. Yeah, luckily, I can do this, and luckily, I'm single, as I mentioned. So it's uh, I've got all the time in the world to do this sort of stuff. Yeah. So hopefully, with any luck, the um. We're starting to get uh, things opening up here again. We've been pretty lucky. We've only had not even 100 deaths in Australia with the COVID. So it's mm-hmm. been pretty well contained here. And uh, yeah. so hopefully some things will start opening up soon and um, we can go back to doing shows because at the moment there's nothing. There's nothing. Yeah. I lost – I remember when it happened, the shutdown happened and I lost – Seventy-eight thousand dollars worth of work out of my diary in the space of three days. Yeah, wow. and that's just counting what was already in the diary. That doesn't count what could have come in in the last couple of months. And uh, so, I'm hoping it sort of, hoping we sort of get the clearance again by sort of October. Mm-hmm. You know, and that way the functions will pick up again for Christmas period, which is my busiest time of the year. And. Uh, and I can get some money coming in again. On a happy note. So I'll just mm-hmm. put my glasses back on because you're a blur at the moment. Sort of. 
Well, there you are. Well, I'm, I'm curious in wrapping up here, uh, Darren, what do you hope to see from the future of ventriloquism? Oh, just guys like you. I think it's fantastic. A, a guy who's, well, when I was 19, I was still snorting and picking the, you know, picking, <laughs> picking, uh, what's I say, picking the nose and whatnot. Right. A little Neanderthal. And to see guys like you coming in, building your own figures and, and performing so well, um, I think it's great. I think it's, it's you know, the, the, even you know, people like Darcy and mm -hmm. and uh, Max Fulham in England. And, yes. You know, it's it's just, you know, he's, he's the other, Jeff Goltz, you know. It's, yep. it's great. All these young people that can actually do it and really do it well. And uh, I think it's, I think we're pretty safe. I really mm -hmm. do. I think it's, it'd be nice to see, um, what's the one thing that I don't, oh, well, the thing that Jeff goes on about the most, I think, which is funny. You've got to be funny. You've got to be as funny as possible, you know. And um, there's been a lot of YouTube clips go up of people that just aren't, they aren't cracking it. They're not, you know, you spend a, I don't know who it was, but someone put up the other day, you spend a bit more time writing before you video yourself. I think that was Is Conrad it? Hartz. I think he that's was right. It was Conrad tired too, of all yeah. the posts. <laughs> yeah, and it's quite it's... true. There's, 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 there's not just here. It's not just in ventriloquism. There's so much stuff. I'm still sort of into magic in a hobby oh, way, sure. so I still watch a lot of magicians. There's still a lot of, excuse my French, crap out there yeah. that people just they think they can learn a trick and just put it straight up, and then even worse, show people how it's done. But. Uh, and even um, I've got still plenty of friends in the music industry and they just they, they just want to perform, which is great. They just want to, you know, look at what I can do. I hope you enjoy what I do. But a lot of it's really bad quality. And, uh, and even as a stand... Sorry? Oh, I was just saying that they probably haven't figured out who they are as performers either yet. Well, there's, there's they're all putting that. stuff that they're learning, yeah. I think it's just a rush. I think it's just mm -hmm. a rush to put stuff up. I've got to put stuff. I've got to put something on, and it's not even because they have to. It's just because everyone else they see is doing it. They feel like they've got to put something up too. Where, you know, it's it's it could be bad for you. The stuff that goes on on the internet is going to stay around for a long time. And uh, you know, I'm I'm just about to once I get this new Daryl done. You know, I'll do new photos and a new promo video and all that just for when the work comes back, I've got a new package to send out to all the agencies and whatnot. Sure. That way, you know, try and try and get rid of some of that Australia's Got Talent stuff off the off the internet and, and uh, you know, stuff where I used to look like I was just one human being instead of two. And uh, just, you know, just, sure. just try and make it look as professional as possible, as he says, standing here with the glare just popping off the top of his head. Holy moly, look at that. It's the window right there. You don't want to see the back view. Is that better? No. Anyway, it doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah, that works. That's fine. That's better. Well, yeah, Darren, so just... Darren Carr. <laughs> it's sorry. Thank I you. Just, I'm, I'm by myself. Help me. I've got no one to talk to. <laughs> no, I should say hello to Glenn Pierce too. Glenn lives ten minutes away, and he's been a little lifesaver for me because we can actually chat about ventriloquism and, oh, and do great. stuff like that. Glenn was supposed to be on the international show this year at the mm -hmm. convention. Um, but we can't come now, unfortunately. Um, Has that been posted officially yet? No, no, no. It's, it's not got nothing to do with the actual convention itself not going ahead. Oh, okay. It's just that uh, their flights, Qantas actually announced yesterday that they cancelled all international flights till the end of July. Oh. Um, so, yeah, we we're going to fly with Virgin and they'll probably do the same. They were supposed to, actually, they went to liquidation um, a few days ago. So, so there's really no way we could get there anyway, and uh, and so it's it's probably not you know as I said we're pretty lucky here in Australia it's been sort of cut down to the amount of uh, of um, of people passing from it, um, but hopefully it'll do the same in the states soon. It'll start yeah. uh, going going quietening down a bit. But um, anyway, we we'll, we'll just have to make it next year or so. Mm. These, are, these are strange times, strange times. But, weird, uh, weird yeah. times. But, uh, Darren Carr, thank so, you so much for uh, feel, being feel part lonely. of Landon Live. 
and for sharing I'm your lonely. story. I'm lonely. I'm lonely. I'm lonely. I'm bored. I'm having to do stuff I've never done before. I, I'm cutting this it's and like, using it as the intro to my videos it's like my, now. It's like my wedding night. <laughs> Thanks for the right. chat. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for being part of Land and Live, Darren. And thank you guys pleasure. for those of you tuning in. See ya. All right. Adios.